Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Felician University, a 21st century education based on timeless values. Bartley Healthcare, nursing, rehabilitation, and assisted living. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Fedway Associates, and by Verizon. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Regional Chamber, building essential connections that drive business growth. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One, in this case, One on Two. Welcome to very special guests. John Kufos is Executive Director of New Jersey Reentry Corporation, and Larry Lesberg, Chair, Criminal Defense at Gibbons. PC, one of the most impressive law firms around. Uh, guys, we are talking second chances for ex-offenders. Put this in context and also let everybody know what the New Jersey Reentry Corporation is. Thank you. Uh, so the New Jersey Reentry Corporation uh, is dedicated to helping people who have criminal backgrounds rebuild their lives and get employed. So typically the, the person who has a felony background has drug addiction issues, housing issues, uh, and specifically has a series of, of of old fines, old warrants, and old tickets. The New Jersey Reentry Corporation works together to clear that, those up with social mm -hmm. service providers, lawyers, and other networks. Well, we're involved in a public awareness initiative about uh, ex-offenders and where they can get information to in cooperation with your group. Uh, I hate to call it this, the Reader's Digest version of your experience and why you care personally about this. Sure. So. Uh, for about the first 10 years of my life, I was a criminal trial attorney. Uh, but more important than that, I was a, as an alcoholic. Uh, I was active alcoholism for 20 years. And in 2011, uh, I made a, a horrible decision to, to drive drunk. And I hit somebody uh, and tried to, to lie my way out of it. Uh, my addiction caught up with me with disastrous consequences for another person. And I went to prison for that. And... I got to see what so many of my clients had been going through for the roughly decade I had represented them. And when I had gotten out, I had asked Governor McGreevy uh, to, to allow me to volunteer at a program. Governor he was, McGreevy is actively involved as the leader of New Jersey Ranchy. He is. He's our board, board chair and a tremendous leader in this field. And he gave me the opportunity to volunteer in, New, in Jersey City. And from there, uh, he allowed me to be part of the building of the New Jersey Reentry Corporation. So for me, this is a... This is a, a, a daily atonement, the work I do. And Larry, with Gibbons, a firm we know very well, what is the connection between you and this organization? There really are two connections, Steve. First, um, our firm provides counsel, attorneys, uh, to New Jersey Reentry Corp to assist them in the, exactly the mission that John has just described. In addition, I'm involved in attempting to move forward an agenda that would liberalize New Jersey's expungement provisions, which- Quote, liberalize New Jersey's expungement policies. Break that down, concrete. Okay. So expungement is if you have a, a, a criminal record, whether it's based on a felony, which we call a crime, or a misdemeanor, which we call a disorderly person's offense here in New Jersey, it's really getting a second chance. That's what expungement is all about. Expungement is all about giving people a second opportunity to wipe the record clean so that they can start their life anew and, and achieve some of what New Jersey Reentry Corp is trying to do. Where does New Jersey rank in terms of this expungement effort, giving second chances to ex-offenders um, compared to other states in the nation? Uh, it's remarkable, Steve, because we think of ourselves in New Jersey as a progressive state. And I think we all think of ourselves as forgiving people who will give people a second chance. And yet New Jersey ranks very low. States like Arkansas and Mississippi and Utah and Kentucky and Minnesota and Indiana are states that have far better 
uh, expungement laws than we do. For example, those are states where you can get expungement more quickly. Our current law here in New Jersey makes you wait 10 years. In those states, it's mm -hmm. five years or less. And the types of crimes that can be expunged include? So you're talking about uh, felony, what would be felony equivalent to misdemeanors. Some are going to be non-expungible, uh, your murders, uh, sex offenses, things of that they're nature. They're off the table. Right, there, there's no expungement. What's on the table? Oh, I mean, offenses that people recover from every day, uh, drug possession, right? Certain types of drug distribution, um, you know, certain types of aggravated assault, things of that nature. So here's the thing, devil's advocate question that... Uh, cries out to be asked. I know people watching us right now on public broadcasting, Fios, digital platforms are asking, Steve, ask why people who've broken the law, quote, should get a second chance. You do the crime, you do the time, that's it. That's not our job to worry about you getting a second chance. A lot of people thinking that, you say? Two things, Steve. First of all, as a practical matter, it's just better for the world. If people don't get a second chance, then they go on the welfare rolls, they may go back to prison, and the statistics are overwhelming How that they will. Is that? incredibly expensive. Hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars per year are spent on recidivism. If we can help going them, back. going back, if we can help them so that they go, don't go back to jail and instead live productive and law-abiding mm -hmm. lives, then they are then contributing to society, paying taxes, and it's a lot less expensive just as a practical matter. But there's a moral element to this as well. As a society, since from time immemorial, we believe in forgiveness. We believe that if people make mistakes, which we all do, every one of us, even you, make mistakes, right. and, 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 you should, and, and when that happens, you should get a second chance. It's just compassionate. John, let me ask you this. You deal directly with your clients. Sure. What kinds of issues are they facing, A and B? What kind of turnaround, turnarounds have you seen that really stand out for our audience that matter? Sure. I mean, the first part with our clients, right, no one should be judged uh, for something they did on their worst day if they're willing to earn that second chance. And what I mean by that, uh, and I'll personalize it, right, if you're willing to, to participate in treatment, if you're going to, to, to handle the root causes of why you committed your crimes, mine being alcohol, if you're willing to handle that addiction, we think you've earned your second chance. So we have clients who uh, have to resolve their addiction issues while they have to comply with different uh, conditions of supervision while they have to try to find a job to a, an unforgiving job market. And when you, and by the way, while they also have to handle old tickets and old warrants from things they might have done in their addiction. Is that a problem? It's a huge problem. So what happens is, is this. Folks will get any number of, of municipal court violations in mm -hmm. one of the, the municipal courts around the state. They'll go to prison. Oftentimes, those violations have nothing to do with the, whatever they pled guilty to or were found guilty of. What so they, when they get out? So they exist. So what happens is the DOC will make it so you can Department get out. of Corrections. Yes, thank you. We'll make it so you don't have a detainer, but they'll give you a court date. If you don't <laughs> go to the court date, or if you can't pay the th hundreds or thousands of dollars in fines and penalties you've They're coming accrued, after you again. Of course, you're getting rearrested. And then you're going back. And then you don't, but in addition, Steve, you don't go to treatment because you're in county right. jail for that offense. You've lost your housing, and if you were lucky enough to have a job, you've lost it. And, where, and the lawyers come in where there? Well, we help the, the two ways. We, as I said before, you know, we help John and his troops to go to court with people to help them resolve their violations, whether it's past parking tickets, whether it's warrants that are there that shouldn't be. Um, these require often court orders, and so you know, the clients who otherwise can't afford counsel um, are accompanied by lawyers from Gibbons and other firms as well um, to help them clear their records. We've built a network, uh, uh, thanks to Gibbons, uh, thanks to the New Jersey State Bar Association, the Young Lawyers Great Division. Yeah. Uh, you know, they allowed me to, to speak uh, in 2015 with Governor McGreevy and then speak every year in Atlantic City on this issue. And thanks to their partnership, we have 70 pro bono lawyers in total across the state in all They're 21 in counties. Zero. Zero. They, they believe nothing. in the cause. They do. They do. And, and the thing is, when you get to see a client uh, go from just out of prison with all of these fines to now they actually have a driver's license, now they're able to apply to a organized labor, to a building trade union, to get a real job, to get a CDL, to become a truck driver, um, and to restore the dignity of work is, candidly... Is, CDL is a commercial driver's license? Yes. It's one of the most motivating things I've ever been a part of in my career. Well, final question for you. We've known each other a long time. Uh, we've talked about law. We've talked about philanthropy. We've talked about a lot of things. Greatest satisfaction you get out of this work personally? Um, you know, I became a lawyer in order to help people. 
And a lot of lawyers say that, but their careers don't give them the opportunity to do it. Gibbons has given me a great opportunity to do it with the Gibbons Fellowship Program, which I run and does all kinds of important pro bono cases. But this is at a personal level where you can represent somebody mm. and, and help them to turn their lives around. It, it embodies the whole idea of a counselor at law who really doesn't just go to court and make legal yeah. arguments, but works on the personal level with the clients. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge that Gibbons is a supporter of public broadcasting, um, as are a whole range of other uh, folks in the legal community. I want to thank you, John, and thank you, thank Larry. You. Appreciate it. Important. Thanks, By the way, go on our website to find out more about uh, prisoner reentry, about uh, ex-offenders and the issues they face. Uh, find out more about this issue. It affects all of us. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. We're right back, I think, with one-on-one -on -one right after this, not one-on-two. Take care. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are pleased to welcome for the first time Dr. Terry Fulmer, who is the president of the John A. Hartford Foundation based in New York City, dedicated to doing Improving much. care of older adults. How did this all happen, the foundation? It's an exciting story, actually. In 1929, John and George Hartford decided to take their extensive good fortune from A&P grocery stores and set up a foundation for the greatest good, for the greatest number. And for the past 35 years, we've dedicated our uh, efforts and our money to improving care for older adults. How so? Break it down, a couple of examples. Sure. So um, we've done it in a, in a number of ways. Initially, we developed the workforce, so we started centers of excellence in geriatric medicine, geriatric nursing, geriatric social work. We developed models of care, such as programs that help individuals prevent falls and to support family caregivers. And today, we're really emphasizing three areas. Creating age-friendly hospitals and health age -friendly systems. Age-friendly hospitals and health systems. Correct. And improving the uh, care for serious illness and, and end-of-life care and finally supporting family caregivers. Yeah, I was just saying this. It's always weird for me to do this because we tape these shows in the air later. As we tape this program in the summer of 2017, yeah. my dad's been dealing with some challenging issues, uh, uh, 84 going 85, but it's my mom who I worry about who is the primary caregiver. She is along with millions of others, is she not? There are at least 20 million family caregivers out there who are exhausted, they are generally, uh, they suffer from depression because of the amount of worry that they have in any given day because they're trying so hard to meet the needs of the people they love who are older and need care. That's but, with help. And Our that, family has help. Yeah. I wonder if families who don't even have that much help, how hard is it on caregivers? I'm so glad you make that distinction because most people don't have help. Most? Yes, and they use their neighbors, their friends, their family. And so those are the people we really have to be thinking about how to support them, what strategies, and we have really made a concerted effort to get the word out about how to support people who are at home without help. Mm. You know, Doctor, you talk about getting the word out. We're partners with the folks at Felicia University yes. and, and the Bartley uh, Health folks as well as part of a series we're doing on ageism, right, yes. aging in America. What is the word that needs to get out, to be very specific? Is it a public awareness yeah, effort? Yeah. And about what? Yeah, so the greatest success story of the 20th century is longevity. It used, it's, We're just living longer. We are living longer. What we now have to do is live with quality and really think about how to not think of, old, of older age as a diagnosis. We want to keep people vital. We know that exercise and social engagement is extremely important to the well-being of older people. And by the way, there will be chronic disease and disorders as you get older. We know that about one in 10 people have Alzheimer's disease. One in 10. Yes. And we also know that that number will double with the doubling of the population. So the other psychosocial, emotional part of this, which fascinates me, for, for some of us who are in quote unquote middle age, mm -hmm. but won't be there forever, and mm -hmm. see our parents struggling and have seen so many others, our fear of getting older, yeah. our obsession with that fear mm -hmm. and ultimately what comes after that. Mm -hmm. Are we any better in talking about it? And I know this is a very deep question for public broadcasting, but I think about it a lot. Yeah. So you're really outlining the phenomena of ageism, which you commented on a minute ago. Are we any better at it? Here's how I test that. Sure. Where, when I'm in, introduced to new people, I'll say I'm a nurse and my, my area of excellence is geriatrics. And there's always a beat, and then everybody laughs. 
they go, <laughs> and what they're really saying, and then they'll say, well, I'm, I'm one of you. I, I need your care. And so they're already identifying and worrying about what's going to happen next to them. I think that we will have made a little bit of a difference when I can say I'm in geriatrics and people don't have that nervous laughter. What does an age-friendly health care system mean? So an age-friendly health care system means you get the right care at the right time in the right place. And what does that mean? Our foundation has some exciting examples. Yes, of, you add the economics in there as you do it as well. Yeah, and lower costs, of course. Thank you. And so our foundation has a program called Hospital at Home. What is it called? Hospital at Home. Hospital at Home. And so what that is, and it's uh, really been generated by some wonderful scholars at Hopkins in Mount Sinai in New York City, means that if you have, for example, pneumonia, you really don't have to come into a hospital. You can have your care at home when you are supported with the appropriate equipment, a person with the knowledge and skills to deliver that care, professional nurses, professional physicians, um, but you don't necessarily need to be institutionalized. Mm. And so we're finding some breakthrough ideas there. Doctor, your foundation supports a lot of research. Yeah. Well. Well, well, the research yes. matters, the information it matters. Does. But uh, as you know, my obsession is with public awareness. Yes. That's why we got into this business in the first yeah. place, to try to right. provide valuable information. How do you get the word out? And is it word of mouth? Is it systematic? What is it? I'd say we're systematic in, in a number of ways. We work with uh, a variety of organizations. Like there's a wonderful uh, Next Avenue is a PBS organization right. that pushes out uh, interesting information. We work with Politico. We work with Kaiser Health Network. We work with every group that can help us. And we have an expert communications team in-house as well. The key is to reach people who need it. And not just the patient again, but the caregivers. Exactly. And the public. You know, to keep them aware of uh, what's possible for a healthy aging process. It is not normal to fall when you get older. It is not normal to become uh, incontinent or to lose weight precipitously. Those are not normal things. It doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to Real happen. Real quick, before I let you out of here, this career yeah. for you, this passion for you, mm -hmm. when did you know this is what you wanted to do? Uh, the first day I became a nurse. So I <laughs> really? became a nurse because my mother was a nurse and I thought she was terrific and uh, she was a real role model. But when I began my nursing practice, what I saw was a phenomena of save them and scorn them. So what I mean by that is that we could get your heart going again, we could cure your pneumonia, we could perhaps fix your fractured hip, but then the rest of it was not perceived as very interesting or important. Mm. And so that's been a passion ever since. The, uh John A. Hartford Foundation in New York City is doing important work. The president of that foundation is Dr. Terry Fulmer. I want to thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you very well much, Well done, getting Steve. the word out. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome uh, Nina Stack, who is the president of Council of New Jersey Grant Makers, which is? A statewide association serving private philanthropy. So private foundations, corporate giving programs, mm. community foundations, individual donors. And a lot of corporate uh, supporters who help up us in public broadcasting, particularly uh, John Pearson, who's your chair yes. at Horizon, yes. uh, talked to us about you. And he said, hey, do you know it's their 20th anniversary? Yes, it is. So, so when the organization was created, right, people <laughs> say there's government, and government's job is to help people who have the least. Hubert Humphrey once said, right, we will be judged by how we treat the oldest, the, the most vulnerable, the children, and everyone you know, who is sick in between. In many ways, it's the nonprofit community doing that, and the Grant makers are helping those organizations, exactly. right? Exactly. So private philanthropy is, the, is where the money comes in from behind. They can't fill the gaps that government can, you know, government is the primary funder for our nonprofit social sector. But private philanthropy can provide some of that seed money. They can provide the research and development money, evaluation money. Mm -hmm. They can test things that government money can't do. And private philanthropy is also much more nimble. So they can help with startups. 
they're really kind of the venture capitalists mm -hmm. for the social sector in a lot of ways. For the organization, the most exciting, important things you're involved in right now include? Uh, well, our Newark Philanthropic Liaison, which has been, we've had a, our man in Newark City Hall who's been working with the administrations and with private philanthropy, uh, has been an exceptional program, and it's actually become a model around the What's country. What's the goal? Well, the goal is so that private funders, private philanthropy that want, that want to help Newark advance can work as effectively as possible, understanding what the goals are of the city and what are the opportunities that exist, and to be able to connect those dots. But how's that a model? Model for what? In places like... Having a liaison, uh, exactly. So in other cities around the country, in county governments, in state governments, it's actually something we saw happening in Michigan at the, governor, uh, the governor's office had a liaison that was a cabinet level. And so that was years ago, and mm -hmm. we saw that, and, and at the time, then Mayor Booker, and now, wonderfully, Mayor Baraka has embraced this. Ross Baraka. Yes, um, to take on the, uh, to have a liaison who's our, he's not a city employee. He, he works for the council, but he's, he's based in City Hall. Right. He understands what's going on. The other thing, and we've done a tremendous amount of programming, and it's never enough to talk about the victims of Sandy many years later um, who are still struggling, suffering, get back in their homes, get their businesses starting again. Your organization is very involved in that. We did a lot of work when Sandy hit because we recognized that this was uh, a watershed moment for our state, and private philanthropy wanted to be as helpful as it could and as effective as it could with the limited dollars that it had. We also were hearing from foundations and donors from around the country who wanted to help. So we launched a series of weekly phone calls and provided uh, donors who wanted to dial in with briefings on everything that was going on that they could learn from. We also heard from our colleagues around the country, like from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and from Vermont after the storms there and mm. after tornadoes in Alabama, what was needed. So we found out that legal services were absolutely essential. In, in Alabama, that was one of the great things that they taught us. They worked with law students. So it, it helped our funders understand where their money could go. Do you advise the prospective funders and help them how to be strategic yeah. and impactful? We, we don't match make okay. uh, between nonprofits. But you give valuable information. We give valuable information. So we help them be good grant makers. We have a, a, a lot of affinity groups that are... What does that mean, affinity group? Right. It means that they're focused on a specific issue. So we have a group of funders who are interested in the environment or interested in education or interested in Patterson. Um, and we get them together around the issues and we'll have people come in and speak about what, what are the issues going on either in that community or around that topic and how funders can learn and then respond in their grant making. Now, in the time we have left, uh, the Trump administration, we don't know exactly what this budget, how it's going to play out. I and mean, let's fast forward. Let's just say there are going to be more and more cuts on the part of federal government to uh, certain initiatives. Mm -hmm. Does that put more pressure on the people you work with, grant makers? Absolutely. Absolutely. And everyone's very concerned. Because the resources in private philanthropy are minuscule compared to what government provides. Uh, that's what people have to understand. I mean, and in, in New Jersey, it's unusual. People would expect that we have a lot of big foundations. Well, because we're a wealthy state. Right. We actually New Jersey, don't. Connecticut, top two. So there's a lot of money. Don't worry. You don't need the federal government, right. you say. Yeah, not at all. We absolutely need the federal government. And there's a lot of work being done now. We have a lot of funders who are looking at their budgets and working with their grantees to understand how they can be as responsive, flexible, nimble that they need um, when, when the shoes start to drop, What's the Johnson Amendment? So, the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment was put forward in the 1950s to take electioneering out of nonprofits so that the idea is that nonprofits who get a tax deduction. That's right. A 501c3 um, status, 501 which, C3. by the way, to disclose the Caucus Educational Corporation, our production company, a 501c3. Yes. We don't get involved in politics, per right. se. Right, right. Or we lose our right. status. So well, therefore that's the idea, because you don't want, in these charitable institutions, you don't want them endorsing candidates. And that's what electioneering would be. They can speak out on the issues that affect their work. There's no one stopping them How from that. How does that impact philanthropy in a few seconds? Well, foundations want to be able to support the work. They don't want to be supporting an organization that is perhaps endorsing a specific candidate. That's not why they got into grant making. Exactly.
Exactly. That's why they didn't. Uh, most rewarding part of your job is? The most what? Rewarding. Oh, I get to learn a little bit about a lot of things every single day. Our members are, are doing work that impacts the lives of so many people of our state and actually our world, and I get to work with them. So I'm thrilled for that. And uh, by the way, check out the website that you've been seeing throughout the entire time. Many of those grant makers support public broadcasting and media and do other really important things. So uh, I want to thank uh, Nina Stack, who's the president of the Council of New Jersey grant makers, um, trying to figure out every day how they can help other people, particularly those who are not getting the help that they need. So we really appreciate you coming in. Thanks, Nina. Thank you. Well done. We'll check you guys out next time. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Felician University, Bartley Healthcare, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, Fedway Associates, and by Verizon. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. What is it? <laughs> it's you. It's me? <laughs> All right, Emma, I know it's not your favorite, but it's time for your medicine, okay? You ready? One, two, three. Emma, Emma, Bob, Emma, Banana, Fanna, Fof, Emma, Fee, Five, Fof, Emma, Emma. Very good, sweetie. How do you feel? Good. Yeah, you did a really good job, okay? Let's go back to drawing.